Hi, uh, my name is Olin, and I'm here to talk to you about Netbook Science. Uh, so I wanted to use this uh, <laughs> this book from Murakami, which is what I talk about when I talk about running. But what I really want to talk to you about is, as I said, network science. And I'm using this picture to motivate the talk by using a network here. So let's talk about the beginnings. Let's start with the beginnings of network science. And well, those is those are with the prolific mathematician Leonard Euler, uh, who is famous, among other things, for the Euler's identity, which is said to be the most beautiful equation ever. Uh, and you can see the beauty in that equation, right? Um, well, there was a very famous problem uh, in Königsberg where there were seven bridges that connected four pieces of land. And well, people wanted to know if there, there was a path, there is a path, I think there's, there are not seven bridges anymore. So there, if, if there was a path to traverse them all without rep repeating a bridge. Um, so what Euler did was formulated this problem as a graph diagram and proved that there, there is no way to do it. There is no way to traverse each bridge once uh, without repeating any of them. Um, so this was how Euler invented the graph theory. Uh, okay, but like, what is graph theory? Like, what, what, what are those graphs? And maybe we should start by, by saying, what, what is it? What is a graph? And th this is a mathematical object composed by two parts. Uh, well, some people say that it's three parts because they count their mathematical, mathematical representation. But for now, let's stick with two, two of those parts, like for now, for maybe for good. Um, these parts are two sets, uh, which is a set of a set of nodes and a set of vertices. Uh, and those latter ones can be thought of as entities. The first one can be thought of as entities, those nodes, and the edges or links which connect them can 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 be thought of as a relationship that connects those entities, right? And both to get both together, they form a graph. So this is the basic description of what is a graph. But I started this talk by saying that we were going to talk about network science, and I started working yeah, talking about graph theory. So this is a main question. Like maybe it doesn't have an answer yet, but like is graph theory the same as network science? Um, well, a lot of people say it is. Like it is the same thing, uh, but in words of Barabashi. Uh, network science is defined uh, not only by its subject matter, but also by its methodology. And then it is, it is composed by four pillars of its nature. And those are interdisciplinary, they, they're interdisciplinary nature. The empirical, which is a, like, it has a data-driven nature, uh, a quantitative and mathematical nature, and a computational nature. So network science, science is composed by all these four natures of it. Uh, okay, so what do we mean by interdisciplinary nature? Uh, well, the aim is to have a common language, a common set of tools and methodology that goes beyond a single discipline. Um, and then network science is used in several fields as a, like a, as, as a tool uh, for several fields such as genomic networks. There's a lot of uh, work being done 
in that regard, um, where researchers usually get uh, co-expression networks of, of genes, and they look at the co-expression of them, and they see how the, they be, behave differently in different settings and analyze their characteristics and in each of them. Um, then we have social networks, we, which doesn't necessarily have to be a online social networks, but this is a pretty picture that I wanted to show because it just is, I think it's just beautiful, like how, how the world is connected, because this is real data from Facebook research. They, they, they measure like the, the connections between people in all the places in the world and see that everyone was connected, which, well, yeah, I think it's beautiful, but I also think like it's too, century 21 21st century so uh, i don't know but it, it does depict how connected is the world mm. then we have transportation networks which are widely used for infra infrastructure optimization and epidemiological epidemiological purposes uh, among among others um, uh, the open flights, as I just said, is very, uh, very, very used. I've seen a lot of work being done with, with that data set. It's not up to date and it doesn't have all the, the, the flight information, especially, especially for non-first world countries, uh, but like, it is what we have and it's very, 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 very interesting and it's very used. Um, and yeah, a lot of uh, multi-layer network research is done uh, or is, is tested on this type of network because you can have like multiple layers of transportation networks. Uh, like you can travel by bus in the city, but you also in the same city, you can travel by subway or you can travel by cab or your own car or bicycle, like a bike share thing. So, so yeah, we have that and we have, like I said, I put here traffic networks, but I meant like, um, what I really meant was ecological networks, which have been used for several years, like even prior to, to when we had uh, already a uniform language for what networks are, like these, these type of graphs, these type of networks, traffic networks have been used for so long that I wouldn't know when they started. And well, networks are all around us. Uh, we can see them everywhere, even in, in games like these, uh, which can tell you um, who beats who in these rock, paper, scissors game. Mm. Okay, let's move to uh, to the empirical and data-driven nature of network science. Uh, so uh, the core of network science is to gain understanding of the world around us. That's what we want to, to do with. Uh, we want to understand systems through the use of these networks and then the pure mathematical concepts are useful, but it's not everything we, we need. Um, even though this Eugene Wigner, Wigner disagrees uh, with that. Like he, he's a master of random uh, matrices theory and it's widely used in network science. And if you are into math, I, I urge you to, to take a look of, at his work. Mm. And well, as any other science, your hypotheses have to be supported by your data. Uh, so maybe uh, like in this example, we have three network scientists that say, say that scale-free networks are everywhere. And that happened. Uh, a couple of years ago that, that that was on our minds. And well, network science is a very young field of study and it's evolving rapidly. Um, 
so things that were considered a fact some years ago now they're they're not that accepted and we can see that now like in the late in latest years we have we've been having a lot of uh, papers attacking those claims mm, okay so we also have a quantitative and mathematical nature we briefly discussed that uh, for, but I wanted to talk a little bit more of the mathematical perspective of network science. And in order to have, like, because in order to have a uniform framework, we need to have a unified language in which this case is mathematics. And well, there are a lot of formalisms around network science and some of them are widely used and some of them are constrained to subfields of study. Um, but one of the most used ones, like the, if not the most common formalism in all network science is uh, the adjacency matrix, which is the mathematical representation of, of, uh, of the network in a, in a matrix way. Um, so what 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 we have here is um, is a, a representation where uh, the columns and rows represent a given node, like each row and each column is one and only one node, and the entries of those matrices are the existence or not of a relationship between them. It depends on whether they exist or not. So for example, um, here we can see that uh, we have node labeled as four. So we go to the column four and the row or add or the, the row four. And each of these entries represent the connections of node four. And we can see that uh, node four is connected to one, two, and three. So all of those entries, like um, one, four, two, four, three, four, and four, four, one, four, two, four, three, they're all ones, but like all of the other ones are not ones because th we don't have any more connections in this network. And we can do the same thing for all of these networks here. Uh, they're represented here. Um, uh, I just realized that you're not seeing my uh, my cursor. Um, okay, now uh, not every network is is studied as the same. This is is not studied the same way, and we can have directed networks here. Uh, uh, directed networks uh, where if A is connected to B, it doesn't necessarily imply that B is connected to A. And then we have, instead of an adjacency matrix, then we have an incidence matrix. And this one is not symmetrical, obviously, as it was previously, I didn't say it, but it was. Uh, and this complicates a little bit the math, but also has beautiful properties. Uh, which are beyond the scope of this talk, but I think these uh, non-symmetrical matrices are like beautiful in so many ways. And I must tell you that there's no consensus about where to put the entries if we should use J, like the incident uh, node as the column, or should I use, sh sh should we use the, the 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 out node as 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 a column, but uh, yeah, you get there's several books and each one of them uses whatever they please, so you should only be uh, conscious of this thing in order to be like have the have the same notation in at least your 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 work. Around the world. Mm. Oh yeah, and uh, we don't have a symmetrical matrix now. Then the spectrum of these matri these matrices is it the, it lies on the 
of the complex spectrum. And that's why it's said that uh, the, the, the mat complicates a little bit. Um, we also can have, um, um, well, there are times where you need to dif differentiate a weak connection from a strong one. And you can do this with, uh, with weighted networks. It means, I mean, like weighting a, each, each edge and, and that gives a specific value to each one of them. Like, yeah, as you can see here, um, this edge has a value of 12 and you, you can measure the direction of this by, by, by having a, 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 a different sign for, for these two entries, depending on which one is the incident and which one is not. We also have a lot of generative models uh, with probability theory as a root foundation in them. Uh, probably the most famous one is the Erdos RNG model, uh, which produces networks via a binomial process. And it's so probabilistic and it's very famous. And yeah. There's also been research about embedding networks into other mathematical spaces, which can help us understand better a lot of property, properties that are not like easy to find in the matrix space. Um, uh, a lot of that has been done in hyperbolic spaces because of the nature of the networks per se. And it's been very helpful and it's being studied right now a lot. Mm. Yeah, and also the statistical mechanics is a field that has influenced the most the, the core basics of network theory. And this paper right here, uh, Statistical Mechanics of Complex Networks by Recta Albert and Albert Laszlo Barbashi, it's the, it, it discusses really well the fundamentals of this, um, the, this connection between statistical mechanics and complex networks. And if you're interested in learning the basic fundamentals of network science, I recommend you to take uh, a look at this, this, this uh, paper. And then we have like uh, one of the most uh, important natures of network science for this stuff. Not now, every, every single one of them is important, but I, let me discuss this one. Um, well, fortunately now we not only have access to a lot of computational hardware resources sitting on our desktops, like right now I'm using this laptop that allows me to do most of the things that I want. And, but also a lot of so software has been released and that allows us to, um, to work on network structure data in a very simple way. Um, so we have this perfect combination of hardware and software that allows us to, 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 to work on most of the network data that we, must, that we can think of. And well, it doesn't really matter what's your favorite programming language or the tool that you, that you like to use the most. If you come from a C++ background or even an, an R background or whatever, like there's a tool for you and it's already there. I, I and it, yeah, and, and if you use Python, uh, probably network X is the safest way to go. Like everyone uses network X. It's so simple and so powerful. It has a lot of things implemented right now. Um, and well, it's written mostly in Python, so you can understand what is happening behind the scenes. And it's super, it's super used, as, as I said, uh, and you can implement new algorithms in pure Python. And you can, uh, you, you, you're able to send a pull request and they probably, if you're, 
if you if what you did is uh, is is needed, then you will probably get it accepted. Uh, but the problem is that it, <laughs> it's the same. That the problem is the same thing. The, the same thing as the 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 advantage, which is is greater in Python, which means that it's very very slow and heavy. But we also have in Python other tools such as iGraph and GraphTool. Those both are written in C++, so they're pretty fast and pretty light and also very powerful. They have a lot of algorithms implemented now and GraphTool is fantastic for statistical things in networks. Uh, yeah, and, and there's another package. This is not a tool per se as the other ones. It's a package that's built upon NetworkX. It, it was written by our friends in Northeastern University from the Network Science Department or program. I don't know what it is. But uh, but they implemented a lot, a lot, a lot of um, algorithms to work with uh, networks. So probably you want to take a look at those. And well, if you use R instead of Python, uh, you don't have as many options as you do with Python. Uh, but it's not a problem because iGraph, which is the same iGraph as the one for Python, because it's 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 a wrapper for the both of them. It's it's written in C++ and it has bindings to R and Python and it's very versatile. And well, R is my favorite tool for visualizing visualizing data. And there are some packages such as uh, GGNet2 and GGGraph that allows you to to do the plotting in the same usual grammar of graphic styles that GGplot gives us, which is fantastic. And well, if you're a Julia Lang user such as myself, then you should know that there are already tools to get you started with. Uh, and probably uh, the live graphs ecosystem is the best uh, we have right now. And it's great. I, and I don't think we need any more. Uh, it works a little bit differently to the previously mentioned ones, the previously mentioned options. Uh, because it keeps everything in a very lightweight, lightweight manner uh, to, to increase performance. So everything that is outside of the structure per se, you should implement it by yourself. So, so you can have weighted networks and light graphs, but you have to implement a way to communicate the network that you have weights. And you have to to come out with a good way to do that, and it's a, it's a good exercise to understand what's happening beneath beneath everything, um, and it makes you think how to optimize your algorithm, which is a good thing. But also, if you don't want to do that, there's also extension packs for it, such as simple weighted graphs and meta graphs, and other things, other packages uh, that, allow, that allows you to do everything you might need in a very easy way. Like, it's all there. I recommend to use live graphs alone, but, uh, but you don't have to. <laughs> um, and I wanted to tell you also that I am developing right now these two packages, graphr2d2jl and chronographs eal, uh, the, the for Julia obviously and graph r2d2 is it's kind of like my version of net rd for python but with more um with more algorithms and it's right now it's more than 20 times faster than net rd which is always good and obviously when you have large networks that the time is a very important limit you have. Um, and I'm also building this chronographs package, uh, which is a package to uh, 
to analyze temporal networks uh, in Julia. There's not a lot of packages that does that. I think, well, I mean, I think there's no, there's no real package that allows you to work with, uh, with temporal networks. So I'm really excited for that one. Uh, yep. Yeah. And there is so much more, so much more, like it doesn't stop there. There are several tools for different tasks. Um, you have Gephi and Cytoscape that are great for visualizing and and they also have some algorithms implemented so you can do some analysis there like i don't recommend it but you can do it like if you are in a hurry and you want to get a, a sense of what you have like you can go in, in one of those packages and like do some clicks and get the work done um, Okay, all, yeah, you also, there's also graph-oriented databases as Neo4j and ArangoDB. And those are the most widely used. I think Neo4j is the, the most common one. I used it, I used it a lot. I used it a lot. And also there, if you, if you like the AWS ecosystems, there's Amazon Neptune. So you can have these in a, these uh, graph oriented databases in a in a in, in the cloud and also you have if you if you're working with big data like real real big data like terabytes uh, or uh, thousands or hundreds and thousands of gigabytes then you you probably already use Spark, and you have to know that there is a, a Spark package for uh, working with uh, networks, which is GraphX, very similar to NetworkX. Uh, it's not as powerful, and by powerful, I mean there's not as many as uh, as many algorithms as there is for NetworkX, but still powerful and it works with Spark. So if you know how that works, it's, it's very useful. Mm. Okay, a little bit of the basics of network science and I'm taking a little bit longer than I thought. Um, let's, let's talk about no, no degree, uh, which is the most basic measure. Uh, and it counts how many edges are attached, are attached to a node. Mm. But if you have direct networks, then there's more than one way to count them. So for example, here we have a node degree of three because we have three edges in this node, uh, but we have an in degree of two because we, we have two incident uh, edges in this, uh, to this node and one, and a now degree of one, because we are, we have an exiting edge, only one exiting edge from this node. Um, a very important property is the degree distribution and it can help you characterize and under, understand the underlying attaching methods or the process that generated your network. So you have your the, the 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 different types, the different numbers of degrees in your network, and how uh, the, what's the probability of you having that degree. So you have the distribution of that uh, the distribution of the of the degrees in your network, and it can be very different depending depending on uh, of the underlying method that generated your network. Um, the clustering coefficient is a way to measure local structure and it tells you uh, how much, how well connected are the nodes around other nodes. Mm. Yes, so it counts the number of possible triangles, the number of triangles that exist over the number of possible triangles as you can see here, all right, right? So here we don't have any triangle in the, 
in the network, but we have, but here we have all the triangles that we can have. So we have these, which is one, two, three, four, and they are all present there. So we have a, a plus one coefficient of one because we have four over four, or maybe we only have three. One, two, three, four, I think it's four. So this should be a fourth, right? Oh, no, 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 this, no, no, I'm sorry. We're counting on on each each node, I'm sorry. So, so how many triangles can we have from this node? Uh, so it's, if we have three neighbors, then we have one, two, and three, right? And here, from those three possible ones, we have only one. And from these possible ones, which is this one, this one, and this one, not this one, as I said before, because this one doesn't have the, the node in question. So it's three over three, which is one, one over three, and zero over three. So that's how we count the, the clustering coefficient. And the triadic closure is a way to study the mechanism that creates an edge that forms a triangle. Uh, for, if, for example, if I have two friends and introduce, and introduce them to each other, then we have a triadic closure because if I created a, an edge that creates a triangle with where I'm a part of. And this um, triadic Triadic closure is very popular right now as a research field of study. Mm. There are also interesting properties at a meso scale, such as community formation. Um, this is how likely it is that similar nodes will be attached to each other and some homophily there. Um, it's, it's a very interest, interesting problem. Uh, it lets you work in a lot of things. Um, and well, we always want to measure things and rank them. Uh, so a very popular set of node properties. And well, I must say that there are also some edge versions of them are the centralities. Uh, centrality, the centralities, uh, they, they give each node a score uh, given some rules. And the, um, well, for the case of uh, the recent trilogy, it ranks nodes by their degree, which we discussed previously. Previously, then we have closeness that <coughs> that closeness that measures the average distance to all of the other nodes. Um, we, we also have betweenness uh, that counts the number of minimal length paths between each pair of nodes that traverse uh, the one in question. It's a tricky one. It's, a, it's difficult. It's a difficult one to get right now. Like in, in a simple way, um, and we also have uh, eigenvector centrality uh, that takes the eigenvector associated to the largest eigenvalue of the adjacency matrix or any other matrix. Um, well, and it could be the, not only the, the largest, but you can have the smallest or the second smallest. And it all depends on the version you used and the matrix you use. Like if, if you don't use the adjacency matrix, but other associated matrices to the, to the network, then you should probably choose a different um, I can I can value, um, and there's also a couple of new ones such as collective influence that counts the number of nodes you can reach at a certain distance. So how many neighbors does your neighbors have? And well, let me talk to you about a list of some a list of some projects I've done using network science. So you can have an idea of what can be done in this regard. Um, um, okay. So uh, you, you can combine network science with NLP 
in some ways as I did in this project and in, in which I used uh, this named entity recognition we see which is to subtract uh, people from from text data and now that I like, and then after you have all the people in your data set which is a book of or multiple books then you can look at the co-occurrences of, of, of people inside a certain passage of the book and count them and build a network based on those co-occurrences. So I did that for multiple books, such as this one, uh, Los Señores del Narco, and build a, a, a Mexican uh, cartel network based on literature. And then I use this network to test robustness through optimal calculation to see how many, to measure how many uh, nodes should I take out of the, net, the, the network in order to dissolve it. Uh, an interesting result, which uh, is, it was just like uh, a serendipity, I guess, is that uh, we found this many years ago that Genaro Garcia Luna, who was the chief of the police in Mexico, uh, he was a key element in our network. He was very central. And well, he, he was recently arrested for his connections to the drug lord. So, I mean, it's, I, I believe it's, it was just a serendipity, but it's still worth to mention that you can find those kind of things. Mm. Uh, well, yeah, I did this. I did this in Mexico, so that's why it's in Spanish. Uh, yeah, this is this is the robustness that I talked to you about before. Um, another project I did was uh, on the Mexican Senate. I built a temporal network uh, of the Mexican Senate. Um, and well, let let me first talk to you about temporal networks, uh, which are the ones that changes their connections along time. So maybe at a certain time of the day, you have different connections. So why, and you have different attributes as a person at each time of the day. So, um, so when this happens, you, you, you have different networks at each, each specific time of the day. So what I did was to uh, scrape the data of the Senate and build a new 4 j database, which is a graph-oriented database, as I told you before. Uh, and then I queried that database into networks, small networks in a temporal man manner, and did a community detection analysis at each time step that I wanted. And I did this with an algorithm that I created. Uh, so, that way I measured the, the dynamics of the whole Senate in a six years period. And here's a, a small fraction of it. And here's the whole six year period. And by doing that, I was able to distinguish the creation of a new party, which is the one in, in power right now. And also some alliances between two former opposite parties. Um, which was crazy at the time. Like we, we don't understand why, why that happened, but we can see it here. And, and, and you can like, you, you can see a lot of things in this, in, in, in this, in, in this plot, like it's very interesting things you, you, you can receive from, from it. Um, another project is, or was, or I don't know, is or was, uh, was to understand mobility patterns after the Mexican earthquake in 2017. Mm. So what I did was to use a bike share service in Mexico City to understand the regular usage patterns and then compare them 
uh, to the ones that we had after the earthquake. So as you can see here, like we, we usually have a very strong signal of the weekdays and we have the time with, where people go to the school or to work and then we have lunch time and then we have again the time when you have to that when when you return to your your home and this happens uh, from monday thursday and it's pretty similar and for friday we also have like uh, a smaller peak in in the usage because uh, sometimes people don't get on Fridays, people are released earlier from their jobs and well, weekends are very different. And here on the week of the, the earthquake, we have a very different uh, situation. Like it's very reduced. Like the number of travels is it's a lot less than we usually have. And also the, the shape, it's, it's very, very different. Now, the earthquake happened the day before this, like it happened here. No, no it happened uh, this, this day. So it's, like, it, it's expected that this has the same shape. But this one, like when, when the earthquake happened and the, the following days it changed a lot. But well, uh, I created a directed and weighted network based on the vibe stations and travels between them and measured how much was it affected by the earthquake. Uh, and what I found is that the system was even more disturbed than it is on holidays. So, so this would be the, how, how much is just the, your your system is disturbed, and these are two holidays, and this was the the day after the earthquake, and and we can see that it was, it it was disturbed a lot more than it was than it is even on, on weekends or uh, or uh, holidays, and and I also analyzed how people were talking about it on Twitter as a as a network too. Like, finding uh, like looking at how many people were talking about uh, the earthquake on Twitter. Um, and I found uh, a decay, an expected, expected decay of people talking about it. Um, but I also found that the World Cup made, made us talk a, little, uh, a lot less about the earthquake than in, in that previous to the to the World Cup, and yeah, it, it's interesting. And right now, um, uh, I'm working in coupling opinion dynamics and opinion dynamics model with uh, risk assessment, and I'm coupling those things with an with an epidemic spread in order in order to understand how our personal decisions help the spread or containment of a disease in an outbreak event. So depending on where, like how our opinion dynamic model, dynamics model work, then we we can have a very different uh, outcome of of the epidemiological process. And well, that's it. Thank you very much. Um, I would love to answer questions or to discuss or to help you in any way I can. Uh, please let me know if you have any of those requests. Thank you very much.